<clears throat> I think the only thing we can hear is my voice. Where did that sound come from? We got that. We just mute this stuff. Okay, I think we are okay now. Just put my stream on there. All right, this is this is my first test of doing uh, a live viewing on YouTube, uh, specifically a live viewing of doing my circuit construction. Usually we have uh, other versions of uh, live streaming to go through, but so this is our circuit. Let me mute myself. Okay. So, and I'm also recording this on uh, OBS or uh, other recording software. So I can turn this into a, uh, a shorter tutorial, which would be an example of the, the task that you would have done previously. Oh, we're going to design this circuit. So I'm going to get myself into character soon, and then we're going to go through and do this whole circuit. <coughs> me, 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 All right. So this is the circuit that we have. It is the clock circuit. You don't have the best viewing over there. There we go. Let me move it outside that side of the screen. This is the clock circuit kit. It is available from uh, whichever uh, import website you get it from. Uh, it's a very basic uh, clock circuit. We can see by the we can see by the image available that it is a four bit clock display. So if you see over here, we're going to get four digits uh, lighting up. So it's going to get some sort of thing. Um, it's made by the Sina Song Hot Trading Company Limited. So and there's a email address for other stuff there. Um, it uses it uses a microprocessor which has a, a program stored inside it and we're going to and it has a, a stock take which we are going to uh, as much as I trust this uh, completely I'm still going to write down my own stock taking list just so I can understand uh, what it means. So the first thing we're going to do is uh, break open the kit. Now we already know this is a higher quality kit that you get from uh, online retailers because it actually comes with uh, some sort of documentation. We see on the tiny screen there we have some we actually have a stock take which means the fact that it already has a stock take is a lot better than um, some other kits so we can uh, anything that we're confused about we can try to use the information of the parts that are available and uh, the stock take list to find out what those parts are. So the first thing I like to do is we are going to get a stock take. So um, I might just for convenience, I might try to make my stock take try to mirror this one. So this one over here we see item number one are the resistors. So I'm going to start by finding those resistors and I'll start by doing uh, my stock take. But the first thing you should notice when you open this kit, you have the circuit, right, which is very bright because of just my room right now. If I uh, no, it's not going to help. You have our circuit. 
we have uh, PCB. So this is where the, the printer circuit board is going to go. We already have the, it's already written out lovely where the digits are. I do like this type of circuit because it does very clearly, so this type of PCB, because it does very clearly show where individual components go. Uh, for example, we have there, over here it says uh, 1K, sorry, 10K. So you already know that a 10K resistor goes there. And so I like that when you're designing a circuit, um, always put the, the actual printing onto the circuit. The, the ink is a very, very small amount of the cost. So it's often very convenient to write down your individual components on there. <clears throat> the next largest part you'll have will be this, which is a... Um, a four digit display, we have four eights. Um, so, so these individual things, are, these are called a seven segment display. So if you have a look over here on the mini camera, we see we have a one, two, three, four, five, six, seven. Um, that doesn't count the, uh, the decimal place as part of the segment of the display, but so technically there's eight uh, inputs per digit, but um, it is called a seven segment display and you would see this in a, a lot of, you, this would be one of the more common um, elements that you'll see in real life, like anytime you see a number uh, ticker that isn't like on an LED screen. Uh, old calculators would use uh, seven segment displays. Um, if you're using the soldering irons that have adjustable uh, thermometers on them, they will have seven segment displays. Uh, microwaves, uh, a lot of commercial products use this because it's incredibly cheap because each one of these segments is each one of these segments is like just an, a single LED so it's actually a very very cheap uh, and effective display uh, then we have inside we have our bag of goodies so this is what we're going to open up first we're going to open up this bag of goodies and then we'll see what's inside them so let's just pour them all onto the ground and then we will start to uh, get individual components and we'll see how they relate to our circuit. So I said I wanted to start with our resistors. Our circuit says there are two resistors over here. So we have our resistors and as always the resistors are color coded. Where's our focus? There we go. Our resistors are color coded. These look like brown brown, red, black, black, brown resistors. So brown, red, black, black. Uh, we can look it up onto a resistor chart, but for this lesson I'm pretty sure it's 10k. I'm just plugging it up to my, um, I'm plugging it up to my voltmeter, just to double check. So that's almost, it's like 9,000, it's almost, it is over 9,000, so get your means ready. Um, so that's the, the 10k resistor. And they're both on the same, they're both on the same string, uh, the same, I don't know what you call them. Like they're both uh, in the same packet, as in like they're connected to each other, so they they would be the same uh, resistance. So we have our 10k resistors, so I'm going to go over here and say, well, our item number, they have item number one and item number two. Resistor, our value, we have uh, 10k. They don't put an R because I guess you don't have to. Or resistors. And our code on the circuit, well, if we look at our circuit, if of our circuit diagram, sorry, our, um, our stock tech list that they've provided us. Uh, but we can also look at the actual diagram itself. And we see over here we have 10K is R1. And if we look over here, 10K is R2. So we already know our code for both of these circuits. We have R1 and R2. 10K, 10K, great. All right, so we've got our two things. Next, we have our capacitors. So our capacitors, our 30... C, 
30p capacitors. Right, so that looks like these are these over here. Oh, can we see that? That's going to be a tough one to focus. There we go. Okay, so you see that 30? So these are our 30p, so pe Pekka? Peta? Pico. Pico because it's smaller. So these are our two. These are two 30 pico capacitors. So component three and component four. Uh, capacitor. Now, uh, what type of capacitor are these? Um, you, the answer is not orange. They're not. Well, they're not. We don't write that down. But these are ceramic capacitors. So they're as different to our uh, these type of capacitors that we dealt with uh, previously. These are our these are electrolytic capacitors, uh, and they are polarized. These are ceramic capacitors which are not polarized. So the the downside is that because they are because they are not polarized, they do not carry as much. Um, they they cannot store as much charge. Uh, thirty, they say thirty p, and we have uh, these are on our circuit. So if we look on our circuit for where thirty p is, we have uh, thirty p is over thirty p over here is C three. Uh, where's our other thirty p? Our other thirty p over here. Where is my mouse? There we go. C2. Alright, next on our list we have our uh, larger capacitor. I'm just going to start sorting these around. This go there. I can put the resistors there. Next we have our, uh, we have another ceramic capacitor in our kit. One oh four, so that is um, that's ten with four. Uh, ten with four zeros, so it's ten to the power of um, ten times ten to the power of four. So that's uh, that's the value. Um, it's a way for them to write larger uh, values on those capacitors. Um, but we can write it down, so we can scroll down over here. We can we can still write that as ten oh four p. That's perfectly fine because we know again this is a ceramic capacitor. If we look at the location for 1004P, over here, so that's C4, which I guess is making sense. Next we have our electrolytic capacitor on our list. Let's look at the values for this. Ten, ten UFs, <clears throat> so ten microfarads, twenty-five volts. Six. We have a cap. Uh, electrolytic, and this is. What value did I just say? Ten UF. And its location on the board. C1. Next we have Ah, next we have a weird component. Next we have So if we look at this list over here. Let's load it up. If we look at this list over here, when we get down to this part over here, Element, where are you? There you go. Element seven. All right. We have resistor one k pr. 
Our kit doesn't have any more things that we traditionally think of as resistors. This device over here, right? This this little component over here, is what they are referring to. This over here is like a uniform resistor. So. Inst when we have this over here, we already said this is a, a bunch of LED lights, right? Uh, this, so this component over here is a bunch of LED lights, and we know that LED lights need some sort of resistance in order to um, in order to reduce the current so that it doesn't destroy itself. So uh, it needs like seven or so resistors because you need one for each different segment on the seven segment display. So you'd need seven 1K resistors. A cheaper option is you can get a device like this, which has one common, oops, sorry. Something like this, which has one common ground, and then each one of these individual prongs connect to a one, uh, 1K or a, a common type of resistance. So each one of these, when you connect to this, so this foot connected to this one should be 1K. And I can actually uh, test that for you by Plug it into my um, voltmeter, and we can see. So let's let's do this and see. See when it works. So right now, I have it plugged in like this. Two ends, and then if I turn this on. One K, right? And then if we let's say we move this red one over to uh, the middle piece, uh, just a middle piece, for example, and we run the test again, oh no, did I get that mistaken? Is this a variable resistor? Or do I just plug it up to the wrong one? Oh, I see the problem. So yes, this is the component over here. Plug, plug it up. Sorry. So here we plug a component up to like this point over there. That's fine. The issue is I was touching two pieces, and so once I touch two piece, once I touch two of those pieces, it stops being a single resistor, and it's like having two resistors in uh, parallel, which is why the uh, resistance was halved. But if we just plug it into one, we see, yeah, so they're all 1,000. Oh, I thought I was going a bit weird there. Oh no, I've bent it. Cool. So these are all one, these are all 1K resistors. Uh, so seven resistor, uh, let's kind of call this one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine. So, resistor, resistor times eight. Oh no, seven. Resistor times eight. These are all one K. And its location on the board is 
uh, this long strip over here, so PR1. Okay, now now we have that put aside. Let's move on. Uh, our next thing we have our switches. Right, fairly normal. Uh, any information about that? They have um, if we measure them, if I measure on my ruler there, they do look like a six by six millimeter. So that looks correct. Switch is a six by six. Oops. Six by six. And its location. Well, both the switches are going to be here. Uh, they're going to be S1 and S2. Next we have Oh I didn't follow oh no I didn't follow the order that they have. Let's just fix that up. So number eight they have a they're gonna have a cry. <laughs> so this is um this crystal over here. Oops. It's a very slippery component. Okay. So this is the crystal over here. Uh, we're going to look and see if it has any detail on it. So it does. Uh, it's going to be difficult for me to show it to you. A12.00, FB3 times 5. So this, uh, if we actually, I'm going to put this into, uh, I'm going to search for this online and see what it comes up as. So A12.000, uh, FB3 times 5, enter. How to read Actually, I can't find a I can't find an easy way to read this code. But let's see if my uh, let's see if my multimeter is actually smart enough for it. This would be something where, unfortunately, would have to uh, rely on the documentation. And I can't read this because it's an oscillator. I don't see any information online, so we'll have to find some other way to deal with that later, but for now what we do know is it's 12 over here. I think 3 times 5 is 
3 times 5 is must be related to it somehow. But we know that it has 12 written on it, so if we had multiple of these, if we had uh, multiple of these, we would know that uh, this would be the tw this is what well, says here on the chart. It says 12 megahertz, so that'd be 12 and a bunch of zeros. So this 12 means that this is the chip that we're looking for. Ah, uh, and that is number six, uh, seven, eight. And it's a crystal crystal oscillator, uh, 12 megahertz. And its location is over here where it says the 12M. And that is doesn't even have a location. Y one question mark? Yeah, Y one. Alright, nine is a PNP transistor. There we go. S8550. Uh, if we Google that, it'll tell us that it is a PNP transistor, so we can um, add that in. Found it here, we can say 8550 PNP. Good. Uh, and its location is Q1. And now we have up to 10 and 11 and so forth. Got our two switches, our second switch is 11, yep, correct. Now our IC socket, this particular part over here, um, yeah, fairly simple. Uh, all we can do is we can count how many pins are in it, 10, 20, good. Definitely counted that right there and didn't look at the sheet to cheat at all. Oh, that's incorrect. <laughs> Uh, 20 pins. Does it have a location? Well, kinda. This over here is like where the, the big part going. Notice how here it just has this like 89C2015. So there, there isn't actually a location for the socket because the pin at some point, uh, the, the IC chip is going to go into this location but what we're doing is we want to put the socket there instead so we can then put this inside the socket so they're going to be on top of each other so there isn't an individual location for the socket so um, but it still goes over here so we're going to put it as the location of U1 then I believe the next thing we're going to do is Next thing we're going to do is do the actual IC chip. We'll write down its code, so... We have the chip and where it is, uh... AT89C2051 Yep. Let's put that in. Eight nine C two zero five one, and we we establish it's the same location as the other place. Let's see if I can get some light. There we go. Um, cool, we have got that. Then we have a, a speaker thing over here. There's no other real 
a massive amount of information on this thing. Uh, this circuit diagram says it's 5 volts, but there's no way that I can uh, read it from the thing here. But this is a, we can tell by the looks of it, the type of circuit is, it is a, like a piezoelectric speaker. So a very low voltage, low current, but should do like a high, uh, high hiss ringing sound. location uh, J1 it does have a positive and negative so we do we do see here that it does have um a positive signal so we do have to make sure when we align it up we do align it up with the circuit board um, we like that lock in the circuit board um, what this does mean is it's not a uh, it's not like your standard um, electromagnet speaker because they they work positive and negative they don't need to be uh, one direction but this is a piezo speaker so it does need to be similar to like a diode it only works in one direction one direction next we have just a power connector standard power connector it's up to it's optional whether you want to install this or not if you want to just plug power right in you can go for that instead uh, but we're going to put it into our thing over here. so speaker is 14 oh Sorry, 15 is the LED, the segment display. So, LED 7 segment. Uh, actually, that's just LED 7S, so 7 segment. And then we'll just say it's 4 digit. And then its location is, well, they haven't given it a, have they given it a location? They haven't, but it's that's a part that should be fairly obvious where it belongs on the speaker. Um, you could have a situation where you have multiple displays, like there's a version of this online which, instead of having a single four-digit display, the, the, these are like cut in half and there's two-digit displays and there's three of them. So in that case, since there are three physical individual components, they would label them and they would probably label them a display one, display two, display three. As you see over here, we actually do technically have a thing here called DS1, so display one is this. So let's just in case you're doing a more complicated one or you want to go online and get yourself a, the next kit why not learn how to do it properly 15 16 is just our connector uh, connector we have uh, it's two pin does the color matter maybe it actually doesn't matter but it looks nice um, it does it have a does it have a location Oh, I believe I have made a, I did an oopsie over here. J actually relates to the, the connection over here. So J1 relates to the connectors, right, the tubing connector. The speaker is LS1. LS1 is the speaker, so I'm going to fix that up on my thing here. LS, LS1, and this over here, this is J1, so... Oopsie. Uh, we have 17 is our PCB. Don't have to do any information about that. Cool. Uh, one thing they didn't, they then they say the the directions, but we don't worry about that. But what they what they didn't uh, mention that was included into the kit are these two things. These over here, and these are like the buttons that go on top of the switches, right? They Right, they go into like this piece over here to make the buttons easier to easier to press. So we can call these just blue buttons or buttons. Blue. All right, so that is our stock take list. Now let's get ready for the fun stuff. I'm just gonna just save my. Uh, work I'm just going to stop my recording and then continue just so I can edit it easier okay stock take done let's start by solving this circuit so when we do our circuits we want to deal with our lowest or well, most difficult components and then our lowest components and then we'll work our way up to our 
higher components. Uh, do I want to swap my screen around for this one? I think I do. Ooh, fade transitions. We got this. Let me just grab myself a quick beverage. <sighs> Alright, so we're ready for um, here's our standard soldering setup. So I said I wanted to deal when we do our soldering. Oh, my recording? Yes. Right. When we deal with our soldering, we want to deal with the more complicated components first, and it's like it, these two are our more complicated components because they have a lot of individual parts. Um, I think this one might actually be the most complicated to start off with, just because it's um, you see, it's it's difficult to actually hold it in. It's difficult to actually hold it in place because unlike this where it's flat you can like hold the circuit upside down to hold it in place this is not flat it's like a single component so it's gonna rock around so we have to um, work with that so how do we actually place this inside this is not a this over here this component is not uh, let me actually get a diagram so I can show you what I'm talking about okay so you can see from the, the, the top screen right now in the corner, this individual component is actually like this. Uh, so whatever, times 10 of them, there's 10 in total. So. This is actually what the what this component is like, and each one of these are one k, right? and, there's, and there's ten resistors. So it does actually matter when you plug it into the component, which end. There's only one end that's the common ground, and so we have to use that. With this device, there is a dot. See there, there is that white dot over there. So that white dot relates to this. The white dot relates to 
uh, that section over there. So, and the white dot also relates to this section over here. So you see how this is a, a one white dot there. So if we align those up together, put this in. So far, so good. Um, oh yes, this circuit board is our typical type of circuit board where we have all the printing stuff on the top and all the copper is exposed on the bottom. Let me see. Let me see what type of focus I'm going to get you for this one. Ah, that's oh, that's 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 not bad for a two dollar camera. All right, I have my soldering iron. Let me just uh, rearrange my soldering iron and my mouse around. Uh, I have my water with my soldering iron. I have my safety goggles on. I have a window open, so I'm all ready to do. Um, I'm all ready to do my soldering with a an a reasonable amount of uh, control for the risk of using uh, my soldering iron. So you should be able to hear that water hissing. A uh, good. Just before I go on a, a one hour soldering rant, let me just uh, check that there's actually sound coming through with this. Yes, we are, we're good. So, let's just get cracking. We've got our solder over here. Get out of the way stuff. Maybe if I do it this way, you'll be able to see it better. Alright, looks, looks quite nice. This over here, without the soldering in. Uh, the next difficult component, um, we could either go for the, we could even go for this, this socket thing, which is going to be a uh, difficult to uh, um, solder in. But I mean, one we've done these before, so well, most of you would have done something like this before. It's also uh, some, here's something that we have to consider. When we put in this piece here, right, once we get all the feet through, we can easily cheat and we can like bend one of the feet with our thumb. And so if we bend the feet with our thumb a little bit, right, it's actually locked in place and it's able to hold itself upside down because we've bent the feet. This part over here, the crystal oscillator, we actually can't bend the feet of this because they're, they're thicker and it's very, very short. So this part will actually be a difficult thing to solder. We have to we have to practically hold it down. So I actually want to do uh, the crystal oscillator. I want to solder this uh, before we do before we solder in this larger circuit because I think I might need some assistance when I do this. So I might have to get a this this might be a component that I actually might need to uh, tape down because as you see here, there's no way I can bend these feet to lock it into place. Uh, it's these parts over here. There's no, there's no way I can do that. So when I just let go, the part falls out. Um, I'm pretty sure the crystal oscillator is not polarized. Otherwise, they would have given us some sort of a notification for it. So let me just get a piece of tape, and I'm just going to try to tape it down to make it as flat as possible on the circuit. And this is something that's easy to do when the circuit is, uh, when the actual real estate around the circuit is uh, fairly empty. 
because as you can imagine, if you have the more parts there, it's going to be uh, it's going to be difficult to it's going to be difficult to get tape around parts. Let me just clean my soldering iron. Yeah, very very good. Yes. Oh, it's nice and clean. Okay, that's one crystal oscillator soldered in. And I'm going to remove the tape. Crystal oscillator installed onto the board. Uh, then I'll do these 20 feet of the um, the IC socket board. I'm just going to do. I'm going to probably going to do. I'm going to do less talking now and just solder this one in. Hmm. We see we have an oopsie over here. Give it a solder. Now I'm pretty sure the circuit, those two are connected together. But let's just uh, let's just double make sure, eh? That's too much of this side. Okay. Uh, the parts do all look. Uh, they all look acceptable. Oh, um, when we had our part, where's my pointer? On our circuit diagram, our socket had this. Let me get you that angle. Our socket had this uh, little nudge, uh, this little little marking there. And as we see here, our chip thing also has a marking there. That's just for the base. And when we insert our chip, which I'm going to do this at the very, very end of the build, because there's no reason to put it in here, but we see this also has a little uh, a notch or a mark or something over here. So those are going to uh, line up with that way. So at the end, this is going to be put in uh, like that. But we'll do that right at the end of the build. Uh, next, what do we want? So let's, let's go with our resistors. At this point, it's pretty much you choose however you want to build your circuit. Remember? Trying to think. I'm trying to think of a rhyme because I like. Um, I watch this YouTube cooking person that always has a, a cheesy rhyme uh, to go with every one of his builds. I don't know. Maybe you are you are the rock when it comes to your digital clock. Something like that.
had one of my students um describe what the uh, what a uh, a good looking soldering job on a circuit looks like, and th one of them described it. It looks like a um uh, a volcano, and I'm like, mm, that's actually a very good way of describing it. So now I use the term uh, when you solder a component, and it's like perfect, and has that nice that nice curve to it. Where's the camera? Is that so? It looks like the with that curvy shape. It's gonna be called the volcano. R one, R two. Let's put in our C capacitors. So these tiny capacitors are they're used to control the crystal oscillator, I believe. Yeah. So they they work in a circuit with this crystal oscillator, so it's gonna give a very um it's gonna give a very consistent frequency to the um the microprocessor, which is that big chip that we have in and we're going to install the middle, and so microprocessor can produce a lot of code. Or it has a, a very simple function on it that's going to control the uh, LED segment display. But it has no way. A computer actually has no way of telling the time. It has no way of counting how much time has elapsed. All it can do is um, it can like add and multiply and subtract and do all this type of coding, but it can't actually measure time. Right? Your no matter what powerful computer you have itself, it can't actually, it can't measure time. Like a human can look at a watch and see that an hour has passed. So what it can do, but what it can do is it say this is 12, it can do maths really, really fast. So what it can do is this is over here is a 12 megahertz crystal oscillator. So that means it's vibrating or it's, it's producing an oscillation uh, 12 million times a second. So if it wants to know when every second passes, it just waits till it counts up to 12 million. So that is, I mean, it's one of those things that's just like, well, that sounds a lot harder, but like for computers, that is actually a lot easier. Just counting to 12 million, no problem. We can literally do that in less than a second. Humans, not so much, but a human also knows, can count to 60 to know when a minute has passed. So, you know, it's... Uh, everyone, everyone, or everything is different. By that I mean, um, obviously humans are, are not a hundred percent accurate with reading time, as in. If you've ever had to uh, deal with somebody who, you, like, you're going to say, "Are you ready to go out?" and they say, "Yep, I'll be there in, I'll be there in two minutes," and they are still like n on the couch, haven't even left. But what I was referring to is, as we say, the computer is going to count its clock up, right, from 12 million. If that clock were to freeze, the com as in like it wouldn't give any more oscillations anymore, the computer physically wouldn't know that time has stopped. Because it it can only go to its next command, its next operation, when it gets a new um, order from like the crystal oscillator or whatever device. So, if that crystal oscillator isn't oscillating, it doesn't actually know to do the next step in the line. It's like it's the equivalent of you reading a book, and your brain knows as soon as you read the first, as soon as you read the letters, just keep moving on, right? If I asked you to and you're just reading, oh, look at me, I did that incorrect. All right, I gotta, I gotta desolder that. Too busy. This actually, oh no, have I ruined my entire build?
Oh, it should be fine. If you imagine, if I told you to, if I told you to wait for like five minutes, right? And you have a clock, so obviously you have a clock, and the clock tells you exactly when five minutes is, and it's all good. You wait five minutes, and you you move on. But if your clock were to break, right? Would you just stay in the? Would you just stay in the place for five for for eternity? No, you'd you'd know time has passed. I'm going to move on with the rest of my life, or I can approximate how long five minutes is. Computers can't. They need to be told every single step, and so that's what we use the, the crystal oscillator for. It's actually telling it to do the next command, do the next thing, and it's telling it to do that at 12 million times a second. There you go. That's the chip in the in the correct location this time. Uh, with the switches, put the blue things on last because it's going to be easier to like fit fit this into a circuit and whatnot. Now we have our switches. Let's put our connector in. Is that going to be a problem? I'll get some wires later. That's fine. Just going to then what's next up? We have a single. We have a capacitor and a switch, and the saving the seven segment display for last. Oh my gosh, that is a that is such a bad soldering job. The part was too hot. The part was too thick to be heated up right. Okay. part we have is our capacitor. Again we've got to choose the um this over here is a polarized component. So we have our pl where are you? Our plus sign is over here. If we look at our capacitor we have our two legs so either longer the longer length is going to be our positive and also our negative over here. So we obviously don't want to put the negative into the positive hole so we have multiple ways to I'll make a mistake. This is uh, an example of one time when they tell you where the positive is. We've seen on other circuits where instead of having the positive there, they'd have like the white lines or the white marking on where the negative is. So I don't know why they like to be confusing like that, but they do. Uh, for this particular circuit, I wanted to. I also want to get all my components as low or as flush as possible because when we get our seven segment display in, um, there is quite a possibility that if you wanted to have this in some sort of a device or some sort of um, like a housing for like obviously if you have a clock you're going to have a housing and this part over here the number display is usually um, very very close to one of the edges like it's 
of the component because it's usually want to be seen from outside. So in general, we want to get all our circuit components to be as low low profile as possible as to not impede us getting our seven segment display to be as close to uh, the surface as possible. All right, our seven segment display, depending on how you got it, you might have yours like this, where it has foam. We just rem simply remove the foam because um, we see all these individual, um, all these cables. Uh, the direction of this does matter. Is there some sort of indication on here? There is a dot. There is a dot over here on our circuit, and I think that relates to this dot over here. So let me just point that out for you. So this dot over he this dot over here on our circuit relates to this decimal place over here. So we plug it in. Oh, aeroplanes are back. All right, that seems to go in nice and easy. <sighs> easy money. All right, that seems good. I'm I'm gonna cut these off. I'll cut these bits off right at the end. Uh, let's put in our IC chip. So as we see here, my IC chip has been slightly damaged. See here, we have one of the feet has been. This foot over here has been uh, bent in. So I'm just going to straighten that out. So these uh, these IC chips are all IC chips are made where these feet over here are like of a soft material. So the idea is that they can be pushed into this uh, individual component here. Now you might find it's going to be difficult to actually align it up, also because like the feet are like wider. They look main screen. So the feet are like they got to go in, right? And they're usually wider than they're supposed to be. Um, so they're constantly pushing against the contacts. So you might have to uh, slightly bend them uh, into a line. What I like to do is, uh, if I go up against like some sort of table and I push slightly, so I just put ever ever so slightly onto the table. Now we see that the feet are like almost parallel, as opposed to before when they were both. So I moved this, I pushed them in. So now when I go to align these in. Uh, making sure that the mark is lined up, making sure that the mark is lined up. Uh, the feet should, uh, and I still need to do it, so I need to make it even more, so I'm going to also push this side in as well. Just like a few millimeters. See that difference now, now the, the feet are like pointing inwards? Just so, because I, I want it to get inside I want them to fit inside these holes. Where well, I mean, you know, better zoom. I want it to go inside these holes here, and then it would, like it's going to slip in. All right, and so once it's in, give it a, a click, and there we go. IC chip installed. Buttons for coolness. Nice. Nice. Now, do we have any way to... Oh, which, how do we know which one of these is positive? That is a great question. Uh, 
Aha. Do we know which one of these is positive? The answer is, I don't think so. J is our connector. J1, J2, and then uh, this over here does connect between our... So it does say 5 volts. But, okay, so over here... I'm going to put something and I'm going to put it in a low voltage just to confirm but so we over here we have this as our connector right? and if I look at the bottom we see this over here where are we over here this is our connector right so these are our two prongs if we look at if we follow this track we go all the way around ooh, we go all the way around it actually doesn't touch over there, it just like sneaks right past and goes all the way and connects to here. And this over here is connected to the positive, right? This over, sorry, this over here is connected to the positive part of the capacitor. Alright, so I'm going to guess that this side over here is the positive. Let me just put a sticky tape there and then I'll confirm it by plugging it into um, my voltmeter and we'll see what happens and then if I'm correct then we will uh, if I'm correct I'll mark the other side with a I don't know something Let's get some wire so we can uh, plug this up to a device and we're going to do the same trick we did before where when we get our wire we're going to tape one of them uh, white so we know that that's always going to be the positive. Except this time we don't have to actually we don't have to solder these because these are using our uh, screw terminals instead. But we can still twist it so the stops the wires from fraying. Now for this particular one I'm going to move back to the other screen.
Okay, we have our two screws in. Let's get our uh, power supplies. This is five volts, which I actually don't know if a nine volt battery will mm, destroy this. You can either plug it in via USB cable or six volts should be fine. What I'll do is I'll test it on my circuit. I'll see if I pump it up to nine volts. I'll see if anything bad happens and then we'll go from there, right? Alright, we well don't have any voltage yet. Now let's Ooh. <laughs> that sounds ominous. <laughs> It works. There we go. Something's happening. We can hear something's happening, but do we know how to... Do I actually know how to code this thing? No! <laughs> Alright, so let me go and... Uh... So we know we got power. Uh, the fact that the lights are working means that this is the correct... Uh, that this was the correct... That the, this side is positive, so let me just... Uh... What? What? How do I keep losing my pen? Okay. Okay, if I mark this side, if I might mark that. Look on the little screen. If I mark those black ones, that's the negative terminal. So now we've got to find a way how to actually code this thing. Let me see what happens if I bump it up to 9 volts, by the way, in case you're using a 9 volt battery. Alright, so it will work on the 9 volt, volts. Just the uh, the light will work, but the the voltage is too high for the piezo. It also seems to be clicking through the things very quickly. That's not ideal. It wants. It's funny. The lower the voltage, the the higher the pitch. Looks like something from like a video game. Alright, so let me just put my soldering iron off now. Let me move it out of the way. I uh, don't know if we need that camera as much anymore. We can go out here. So we want to learn how to, we want to program.
I don't even know what this thing is. No. That is better. I disconnected you. Alright, so let's see if we can find out how to... Let me see if I can... Uh, four digit...
Ah! You got me. Okay, so apparently... A is the hour. The time right now for me is 10... This is 24 hour time, so... Ah, I missed it. <laughs> 10. B is minutes, so it's 55. And by the time we do this, it's probably 56. 56. Uh, C is hourly bio. Don't know what that means. Uh, D is uh, hourly alarm. We don't need that. Off. G is uh, alarm 2 on or off. We don't want an alarm. Uh, through everything so cool that is the clock and that is the time for me right now it is 10.56 so as long as I keep this plugged up to the power congratulations I have a clock woo so um, and this doesn't have a memory so every time we disconnect from power it's going to be a concern but what I could do now is I could make myself a nice little um oh yeah I might do that I might make a laser cutting box tutorial for this thing um, and we'll just get a, a nine way batch uh, not a nine way uh, we'll just get a, a battery pack uh, maybe a 9 volt battery pack with a resistor in there, or probably just 4 AA batteries. 4 AA batteries would probably be better. We'll just get 4 AA batteries, uh, and we'll fit that in the back. 4 AA batteries might be big. We boast of the size of, size of the clock. Would this work under 3 volts? Uh, it's very dull at 3 volts. 5 volts is an annoying voltage. Uh, is that 3 batteries? That's 4.5 volts. Possibly. I could just get 9 volts and throw a resistor in there, but it's going to get hot. Uh, I might get a... I could get a little buck converter. I'll get, the point is I'll get something to just plug in 5 volts into this battery pack, and then uh, I'll have a portable clock that can work, and that's not the worst thing. In fact, I might even get my box, I might even laser cut the instructions on the back, so any person who sees this can know what to do with it. Right, let's see it for the construction, and then later we'll um, clip this into a video to actually see what can actually happen. So, anyway, that is cool. Need a bit of uh, 1058. You see the, the, the thing in the middle is the second timer actually fairly accurate I think based on my opinion but yeah that's uh that's the clock so, oops and now that I've reset it yeah it always it always comes back at 1250 it always comes back at 1259 it's because it has no memory so that's obviously the programming uh, always started at 1259 so uh, we have to find a more permanent solution for uh, powering up this circuit so, I'm going to close the stream now. Uh, later I'm going to edit a video to talk about how the 7 segment display works. Alright, thank you for watching. And goodbye, and I will see you next time.